Okay, well, good morning once again. Maybe I should put this on here. Good morning once again, morning. dear saints. Good to see you all. Today we're going to be in the book of Job, chapter 3. And as you're locating the book of Job, chapter 3, I just want to remind us all that Jesus was asked, what is the first and great commandment? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. We love God with our minds too. And today, friends, is not going to be a light morning. You didn't come here to hear a bunch of fluff. You came here to hear something important, things of eternal significance, things that are God-honoring, things that are helpful. But this is going to require that we engage the faculty of reason that God gave us. And in that way, we can sing praises to God with understanding, as the psalmist tells us. Sing praises with understanding. Not just a zeal, but a zeal with knowledge, as Paul tells us in the New Testament. The book of Job. Well, we've been walking with Job for a little while, haven't we? A, a very remarkable person. The patriarch Job, once happy, healthy, wealthy, prosperous, influential, well-respected, in a moment lost everything. It was all gone. Everything the world said you should be desiring, he had it, and suddenly it was all gone. And the man we saw last time was in great physical pain. He was enduring horrible mental anguish. All of this, of course, at Satan's insistence. You remember the confrontation between God and Satan? God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one on earth like him. He fears God and shuns evil. And Satan said, as a matter of fact, he only worships you because you bless him with such abundance. In other words, Yahweh, you're not really worth worship. Your character, your attributes, your nature, that's not worthy of worship, really. No one really wants to worship you. And God said, oh, really, is that so? And so you know how it went, the confrontation. Satan was given permission by God to afflict that man horribly. One thing he couldn't do was kill him. And so he just came short of that. Well, what happened? Job's three friends came to visit him. Their intentions were good. They were going to mourn with Job. They were going to comfort Job. And when they came upon the scene, they saw Job sitting in the ashes. They didn't recognize him. Remember that horrible thing? He was just a shell of his former self. Unrecognizable. Everybody sat in silence for seven days. Can you imagine? A week of no talking. We're just so overwhelmed with grief, no one's saying a word. Suddenly, after seven days, the silence was broken. Who speaks first? Job. What does Job want to say? I hate my life. I wish I'd never been born. I wish I were dead. We looked at that. I mean, we really need to get the force of this. Job is suffering in ways probably we never will. And Job said, if I compare what I'm dealing with right now to all the good things I had in a former life, it wasn't worth being born. And of course, Job was looking at the world under the sun, the world without reference to God. And if that's how you're going to look at things, then maybe you're right. Maybe it isn't worth being born. But as a matter of fact, that is not a true picture of human existence, is it? You and I know that human existence persists beyond the grave. God is going to hold us in existence into eternity beyond the grave. And the choices we make here and now are going to influence, affect profoundly what our experiences are going to be like in eternity. For those who love and trust Jesus now and receive him for salvation, they're going to go to a blessed place he's gone to prepare for them. And the blessings... We haven't seen the half of it. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered the, into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those who love and trust Jesus. And it changes things. It's a game changer. It changes your perspectives. Remember the Apostle Paul? He was looking at this the right way. We consider, you and I, all that that man endured for the sake of Christ and the furtherance of the gospel. The man was whipped, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, beaten, arrested, thrown in a dungeon. He was misrepresented. He was 
slandered, even by so-called brothers. And you know what Paul said about, about all that? He called it light, momentary affliction, not worthy to be compared with the eternal weight of glory, the glory which will be revealed in us when Jesus Christ tears the sky wide open and returns and calls us forth from the graves and gives us glorified existence with himself. And we shall be with the Lord evermore. Paul says, when I compare what I'm enduring with that kind of thing, the present distress is nothing. And the longer we're with Jesus in that place that he's gone to prepare for us, the longer we're there with him, the further back in time will recede all the present sufferings until they become in the past an infinitesimal little speck of nothing. And that's the right way to look at it, friends. Kind of hard sometimes, but that's the correct way. And Paul had a handle on this. Besides all that, Paul said, you and I know something, K-N-O-W, you know it, you don't hope, wish, or suspect, you know that all things work together for good for those who love and trust God, those who are the called according to his purpose. You know it. How do you know it? Because God said it. And his word is the ultimate authority, the final court of appeal. It will never be revised or amended or altered or any such thing, his word is forever settled in the heavens. And that's something dependable as we walk through this life. Isn't it good to know there's something dependable? And it's not the promises of politicians either, is it? Of course not. Wow. All right. Let's go into chapter 3, and I want us to hear Job now. Job has a bitter complaint. Chapter 3, verse 11. Some questions. Chapter 3, verse 11. Job says, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why did the breasts that I, sh why the breasts that I should nurse? And then jump ahead now, please, to verse uh, 16. Verse 16, more questions from Job. Or why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They do not fear the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death but it does not come, who search for it among uh, more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Notice this short word, this term that keeps popping up. Why? Three letters, but very powerful. An interrogative. Why? 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 It is a key question, saints. A very key question. Throughout human history, around the world, and even to the present hour, People everywhere frame the problem of evil and human suffering with the question, why? Why? This fact, the fact that people do this, reveals a lot. Even though these people are asking this question out of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, friends, the question is not rhetorical. It's meaningful. They are really looking for an answer. When a grieving parent has just heard her child has an incurable disease, the, the parent cries out, why? Why us? Why this family? Why me? Why my child? That is not just an empty question. That question is looking for an answer. And it reveals, when we ask that question, it reveals in us a deep-seated knowledge of the world as it really is. When you ask why, you are just sort of assuming that you live in a world in which meaningful questions can be asked and meaningful answers can be reasonably be expected. When you ask why, you expect something meaningful in return. That, I mean, that is the heart and soul of the whole scientific enterprise, by the way. Scientists are asking meaningful questions of the universe. They're doing research. They are expecting that their research is going to yield meaningful and reliable answers. But don't you understand, friends? Don't you see? That kind of thing, asking the question why, 
makes absolutely zero sense in an atheistic universe. In a world without God, literally everything is random, accidental, and meaningless. On the atheist conception of the world, the universe sort of popped into existence, sort of popped into being, uncaused, for no reason, out of absolutely nothing. On that view of the world, the universe is sort of um, an accident. It's a place in which randomness, chance, is absolutely ultimate. And in a world like that, it makes no sense to ask questions of anything. Why would you ask the question, why, of anything? There's no reason for the created order to even be here. There's no reason for anything within the created order. But our continual asking why, especially when it comes to the issue of evil and human suffering, reveals that deep down in our heart of hearts, we all know that God exists. That's why we're asking the question, why? We know that God is real. We know that he has a plan for the world and that nothing escapes God's notice. That's the very reason why you get up in the morning and you make plans for the day. You decide, I think I'll eat this cereal and not that cereal because this tastes better, right? That's how it went yesterday. I could reasonably expect that it's going to be the same today. Things aren't going to suddenly change for no reason. God is the reason why you get up and you make plans and you do things. Because deep down, you know that God exists. He runs the world. There's a, there's a certain dependability in the created order because God has put it there. Nothing escapes God's notice. He has given meaning and value and significance to everything under the sun. And God has given everything in the created order an identity as it relates to his plan. And he has sown all of this knowledge into everyone's heart. Not just the professing believers, not just you Christians here today, or you Christians who are watching via live stream, but I'm saying he has sown that into every heart, even into the hearts of people who say they don't believe in God. No, you do believe in God. That's why you ask the question, why? That's why you're engaged in science. That's why you're making moral evaluation in the world. That's why you're calling some things evil and some things good. Because God has put that knowledge in your heart. The problem with the atheist isn't that he doesn't believe in God. It's that he doesn't like how God has chosen to run the world. That's the problem. And that's a problem we are all going to face, even as Christians. There will be times when we go through hard things. Our church is going through a hard thing right now. Praise the Lord. It's bringing out the best in people. It's drawing us all closer together. It's deepening friendships. I mean, I love it. But the thing that we're enduring is not fun, is it? A double distress. A former church leadership that's, I think, victimized all of us. And an oppressive secular government system on the outside that is not exactly behaving itself in an upright fashion. A double disaster, a double blow to the local assembly. It won't obliterate us. It won't destroy us. It'll have its purifying work in all of us. Won't be fun, though. It won't be fun. The fact of the matter is, people all over the world, even the regenerate, to some extent or other, we are comfort-driven, we are pleasure-driven, we're often not driven by righteous desires. And God would have us to be all the time, everywhere, driven by righteous desires, to glorify God. The atheist says, I don't want to live that kind of life. I don't like how you've chosen to govern man, God, so I don't believe in you anymore if I ever did. Now, friends, I have a great big thick book in my library. It's called The Oxford Companion to Philosophy. You try reading that. If you're having trouble sleeping, you can read that book. <laughs> that will help you. I guarantee it. Not an exciting read. However, there is an entry in that encyclopedia, that companion to philosophy. The entry is anti-theism, not atheism. Atheism is supposedly the lack of belief in God. Anti-theism is something else. And the, this philosophical work says, anti-theism is a deep-seated hostility and hatred toward God, the God normally conceived of in the monotheistic faiths like Christianity. 
And the book goes on to say, it is a transition to atheism. Oh, what, what was that again? You start off hating God, and then you are brought to a place where you no longer believe in him. I thought atheists didn't believe in God for intellectual reasons. I thought there was intellectually sound reasons for rejecting God. No. We are being told in the secular publication the same thing God told us 2,000 years ago. People just don't like God very much, and they convince themselves that he's not real. And God says to those people, you're a fool. Why are they, why are they being foolish? Friends, they're being foolish for this reason. Because to think properly, to reason correctly, to bring down a true conclusion in your reasoning process, to form an argument properly, requires just those things that only God can provide. So to turn around and take those things that only God can provide and use them to bring an argument against God is ridiculously stupid. It's fool. That's why God says it's the fool who says there is no God. I mean, you couldn't reason up, down, or sideways or say anything meaningfully if God did not exist, saints. That's important that we get the handle on this. And I want to share something very personal with you. Very recently, I took a prayer walk in the morning. We were very concerned about church affairs, very concerned about government oppression, concerned about Marcus's health. We've gotten some encouraging results back. We're happy. But back then, a little while ago, I was absolutely distressed. I took a walk to be alone with God and I said, you know God, I've been praying for our church. On my face in the sanctuary, praying, fasting, praying, praying, pleading. And what happened? I got fired unjustly and the unjust man that did it sits there as king over the whole thing. I said, God, where are you? And the thought crossed my mind just crossed my mind. Maybe deism is true. Do you know what deism is? New word. Deism is the idea that there is in fact a God who created the world, and after he created it, he just sort of walked away from it. He doesn't care about it anymore. He like wound the clock, put the clock down, walked away. And the thought crossed my mind, maybe deism is true. And instantly, God spoke to me. I mean, and it was hard. He said, if deism were true, you'd never know it. And I got the message. I got the message. I couldn't know anything unless God enabled me. And he told me, if deism were true, you wouldn't know it. Obviously. And I said, yes, Lord. Forgive me, God. Forgive me for contemplating such a thing. Only the personal God of the Bible can and does give us those things that are needful for us to think anything properly, to reason correctly, to to bring down any conclusion, or to create any argument that was valid. Only God can do it, and he does it. So to turn around and doubt God with our reasoning is hopelessly stupid. I'm not going to try it. God has to exist. He's more than the best of of many rational options. He's the only rational option, saints. He is the only rational option. He's all we have. And that's infinitely more than we need. God. And I'll tell you something else. For the atheist or anybody else to say, what's going on in the world isn't right. To look at something and say, that's evil or that's good. To say that something is wrong, objectively, absolutely requires the existence of some objective standard of right and wrong. A locus and paradigm of moral goodness that is qualitatively greater than us. When you look at something and you say that's wrong morally, you are saying something more than, I don't like that. Isn't that true? But there could be no objectively right or wrong, good or bad, unless there's a God in heaven who establishes these things. That's important. We look at the world, everybody looks at the world, and everyone says the world is not as it ought to be. Everyone feels that way, and we try to do our best to make it the way it ought to be. But there is no way things ought to be without God. 
There's got to be someone in charge. There has to be someone with a plan around here. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says the world will be what it's supposed to be one day. That's what Jesus came to do, friends. He came to reconcile all things to himself by the blood of his cross. And the Bible, re- Bible says that right now the earth is sort of limping along. The whole created order is groaning and travailing together in pain, even until now. God says this is not the best of all possible worlds. Of course it isn't. That's in the future. The best of all worlds is coming. But this is the way God has chosen to get there. It's the best way to get there. And we don't say to God, well, God, I don't like how you've chosen to do this. We don't say that. We say, yes, Lord, give us grace to cope in the present hour. And Christ is pleased to give it, saints. He really is. But in a strange and ironic way, the problem of evil and human suffering actually becomes a positive case for the existence of God. You couldn't call anything objectively evil if God wasn't there establishing what amounts to objective good. We couldn't call anything wrong unless God was objectively establishing for all of us what amounts to right. And God has put that sensitivity of his moral laws into every heart. And that's why even the atheist can can discover what's right and wrong in the world. Even he can recognize evil when he sees it because God exists. And he has put that sensitivity in everyone's hearts. Friends, that, that's some, that is some clever apologetics, isn't it? <laughs> clever apologetics. I think it's sound, but friends, of course, you're not going to just go to a hurting person and give them a whole philosophical diatribe. That's not very helpful, is it? Maybe you can just sit with somebody who's hurting and read some scripture. Read God's word. You know... Uh, Let God's word do its work. This person doesn't need to know how smart you are or how smart I am. Wait until they're ready for this, and then you can give it. Job was crying out in bitter anguish. He said, why is this happening? Friends, people in your life and mine too are going to come to us, and they're going to ask you, why is God allowing this? Why this horrible thing? When that happens, saints, for the most part, there's a fly. For For the most part you're going to have to say this. God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing what is happening. And he is going to use what's happening for the purpose of a greater good. That you can say with confidence on the authority of the word of God, that you can say. The next question out of this hurting person's mouth is going to be this. What is that reason? What is that greater good that God has in mind? What is the reason exactly And most times you and I are going to have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Right there, oftentimes that person will say, well, I don't like that. That's not satisfying to me. That's not convincing to me. I'm still an atheist. I want you to understand that last statement there, that this doesn't help me, this is not satisfying to me, that is nothing like a rational argument against what we believe, saints. That is just a little bit of autobiographical material coming from the hurting person. They're just telling you their perspective on things. That's not an argument. And the fact that you and I can't tell a hurting person exactly why God is allowing the pain to continue, that is no refutation of Christianity. You've not been bested in debate. How could we possibly know the greater good that God has in mind? How could we possibly calculate that? My three-pound brain is supposed to handle that kind of thing? Impossible. If my little brain could understand all the ways of God, then he wouldn't be God, would he? So you can say with confidence, God has a morally sufficient reason for this present distress. He will use it for the purpose of a greater good. Greater goods will come into being because of what he's allowing. And if you're asked the specifics, you may have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Maybe God will share it with us one day on the other side. What we don't want to do is be like Eliphaz. Eliphaz is the first of Job's friends to say something. It says in Job 4.1, Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered. Dear dear friends, it was not his job to answer. Because he is going to, we'll see this next week, he is going to launch off into this big, speech with fine-sounding words, and the man knows nothing 
of what's really going on here. He's clueless. His intentions are good, but he's clueless. He's speaking words without knowledge, and he's actually going to cite supernatural endorsement for the things he's saying. He is not going to be very helpful to Job. He's going to be a horrible discouragement to that man. And in my opinion, this man, Eliphaz, has heard from Satan. Satan is that supernatural endorsement. Because he is going to start accusing Job, this hurting person who's been shattered. And that sounds like something Satan would do. Satan accuses the brethren, Revelation 12. Day and night, Satan is accusing all of us before God. He is the accuser of the brethren. And he is a discourager too. In my opinion, Satan came to Eliphaz, filled his head full of wrong beliefs, and then launched him in Job's direction to discourage that poor man. You know what? We are not getting the force of what Job actually endured. Didn't lose one child, lost all his children. Didn't lose some of his property, lost all of his property. Didn't lose some of his health, I mean lost all of it. And his reputation, it's all gone, it's all up in flames. And now he's got a supposed friend coming with words of discouragement. How do you like that one? And in my opinion, it's Satan who's behind the whole thing. Two lessons to, to gain from this. Two lessons to take away from this, and then I'll, I'll close. Lesson number one, let's not be like Eliphaz and offer insights we don't have. A terrible problem that many Christians have is they don't know when to say, I don't know. The older I get, the less I seem to know and the less ashamed I am of saying, I don't know. I'll look into that for you. If I come up with something meaningful, I'll get back to you. There's no shame in that. I don't know. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, do not think beyond what's written. He said, learn in us not to think beyond what's written. When someone asks you a theological question, you can give them a good answer from the Bible. Open the Bible. This book will never be revised, updated, amended, changed, altered. No. Forever settled in the heavens, you can speak with authority and confidence when you're sharing the scriptures. But when someone asks you a question, you don't know the answer. Like, why am I enduring this hard thing right now? Why did God take my wife? Why did God you know, kill my children? Or why did this horrible crime occur? Why did I lose everything? And so on. You're just going to have to say, I don't know specifically, but I'm there for you. I'll try to help you in every way I can. I belong to a loving church family. Come and we'll pray for you. We'll help you if we can. I mean, those are the kind of things you can say. Don't think beyond what's written. Don't offer a made-up answer or your best guess. That's not helpful to people, is it? And secondly... Don't listen to these people. <laughs> don't be like them and don't listen to them. They don't have a clue. God has spoken. God has told you who and what you are in Jesus. You know that? He has a, God says, may I have a word here? <laughs> the Bible says in Romans 3, 4, Though every man a liar, let every man be a liar, but God be true. You, now get that one. If every person on planet Earth said A, and God in heaven said not A, guess what? Not A is the right answer. <laughs> when Jesus walked into that upper room and saw a little girl there who had stopped breathing, she was becoming cold to the touch. Her lips were blue. And Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Some people laughed at him. He kicked them out. He said, little girl, I say to you, arise. And she arose. And at that point, I think you'd be, you'd be just about ready to say yes, Lord, to anything he said. She looked dead. She felt dead. We watched her die. But the Lord said she's sleeping. I guess she's sleeping. Yes, Lord. What God says is true. No matter what our five senses may reveal to us, or any human reason may reveal, God said it. It's true. God has spoken. And my recommendation this morning is that this church always and evermore holds fast to our faith, our integrity, our witness, our confession, and that we overcome every obstacle thrown in our way 
by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. This church is not going to be decimated. Wicked people will not destroy this local assembly. We will not be crushed to powder. We're going to merge through this by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of his testimony. In fact, the great apostle Paul says this, the great apostle John, rather, says this is our testimony. This is our victory. Even our faith, which has overcome the world. The world threw the worst it could throw at a man, and it threw it at Jesus Christ, and he overcame. And he said to all of us, you're going to have trouble. But don't get overwhelmed by this. I've overcome the world. And that strength is available to us too. Be strong in the Lord, says Paul, and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6.10. That's the part of the marching orders for the church. Go forth in strength, power, love, wisdom, patience, all things needful for us to do what we need to do will be granted to us by a sovereign, thrice holy God who doesn't lie or deceive his people. We can walk in strength, friends, and let's do it. Be a blessing to the world, be a blessing to each other, and be honoring to God. Let me close with a prayer, and then we have a final song, right? All right, let's pray. Blessed triune God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before you with grateful hearts. Thank you, God, for committing such awesome things to our care. Thank you that we are in all the world the custodians of the life-saving gospel of Jesus. And all that that means, uh, Lord, may we reflect on this. Lord, may we go forth from this place in strength, in power. May we have renewed resolve, resilience, stick to itness to do what we are called to do in this dark world. May we take real ground for the kingdom of God. May we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, not only in our minds, but in the minds of the unregenerate. May through our testimony, souls get saved, knees bend to the lordship of Jesus. Use this local assembly, O God, in a mighty way for your glory and for the good of those that you love. In Jesus' precious, matchless name, we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise our great God. And God bless you all, dear saints.